that's just my style. I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking, good or bad, but I'm always, you know, and it, and it's funny. And I try to do this in music and everything. I always try to come at it from love and generosity, but also deep truth. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, I interview peak performing innovators in the creative, social impact, and earth conservation spaces. I also bring you ideas and techniques that you can grab and use to set goals, create, and unlock your potential for changing yourself and the world. And now let's get to the show. Hello and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Thanks so much for taking the time to be here. And you know what? I did not ask this gentleman who is my guest, which I meant to do, how you pronounce his last name. So you're going to have to help me on this. Pete, <laughs> I, is it is it hey, Muller or Miller? It, it, it's Muller. <laughs> Muller. Muller, Isolde. I, you, know, you know, it's funny because my dad was Austrian and in Austrian it's Muller with, the, right. with two, the two dots over it. And so the it's Umla, between. Right. Mm -hmm. And so some of the people that came over has made it Mueller and some of them made it Muller and I'm a Muller. So it's Pete Muller. And, yeah. You know, <laughs> Let me go. Now, now and, and, you know, now you're introduced. Here we go. But, you know, it's funny because my I'm an immigrant myself and my name, uh, everybody mispronounces it. So I've had to go, OK, say she is old and then they say she is old and then I say, say is old and then they go is old and I'm like is old and often people go, oh, you mean Imelda? No, not Imelda, not Isabella, <laughs> Isolda. So I totally understand. But I realized right before we started recording, I meant to ask you and forgot. So let me take this introduction, Pete Muller introduction, take two. Let me tell you about Pete Muller. Pete Muller is a problem solver. Whether he's writing songs for his critically acclaimed albums, revolutionizing the way Wall Street works through applied mathematics at his trading company, I totally need to know more about that too. Winning as a semi-pro poker player or authoring crosswords for the New York Times and Washington Post. I've done some of those. I've been stymied by many, so that's exciting. He's been profiled in Forbes and Business Insider and seen recently making ambitious real estate moves via the New York Post. He's also a fantastic music well, I will say musician, but also songwriter, and his piano plays is amazing. You're going to love Gone. I'm going to put the link to it in the show notes. I've been singing that song and listening to it nonstop. I'm so excited. And one of the things that I'm really excited to talk to Pete about is that he's got a deep curiosity about how writing and performing can improve one's outlook and focus one's mind. I am so excited to have you here, Pete. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's it's my pleasure, Isolde. I'm 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 excited to be here. This, this guy sounds really interesting, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, and it's like you, most of the things that you do are catnip to me. They are, you know, being a musician, being someone who looks at music and singing and performing as something more than just music, singing and performing as something greater, is one of my sort of prime directives is teaching people how to how to think that way that creativity is so important so i'm particularly excited to have you on the show to talk about some of this and also how you manage to go from crosswords to trading to professional poker to music and all of those things in between because it, it, it seems to me like you're a polymath so i would love to chat with you about that as well but let's go back before we do anything else I would like to see how you started. What made music specifically something that interested you, fascinated you, and has become so much of who you are today? You know, it's funny. I, I It's a couple of random things that happened in my life. And if they hadn't happened, I think music would be a lot less important. So uh, the first one was I, I took classical piano lessons as a kid. And after about five years, I got reasonably good. I, I got bored I, and, mm -hmm. and I quit and I was done. And it was a jazz piano teacher in Denville, New Jersey. And I only went to him for a year and a half, two years, who taught me how to improvise. And that changed my life because it made me realize that to me, music and the stuff I love about music is about figuring out what's inside and having mm -hmm. it come out and creating as opposed to simply interpreting a beautiful piece that somebody else has written. Mm -hmm. And that improvisation started me down playing jazz bands and, um, you know, eventually writing. 
Um, and so that would be the first thing that happened. And the second thing that happened uh, about 20 years ago, I went through a, a, a very challenging, maybe a little more than that, breakup uh, where my heart was ripped open. Mm. And the only way I found that I could process it was by playing music and starting to write music. And that's when I started songwriting. And, you know, I, 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 I realized that playing the songs and singing them with emotion was a great way of being in touch with what was really going on inside me. And then I realized, wow, okay, cool. I, I can start this, but there's a, there's a real art to it. So I, I, I started working on writing songs and I kept writing a lot of songs. I started the songwriter circle. And, and that, that second thing is the thing that got me into, um, you know, where I am today and why, why music is so important. And, it, and it's really, for me, it's once I, get interested in something and passionate about it i just throw myself into it mm. almost in an obsessive way sometimes it can definitely get in the way of uh, of relationships and in fact it was getting into something else obsessive that caused that breakup but i've i've really thrown myself into becoming the best singer and writer and performer that i can be and that that's been a fun part of the journey and build it and and building on that learning to improvise in the beginning. Uh, so much so that when, when people ask me, I have a couple kids, people ask me about their kids and how do I get my kids in the music? The thing that I, I always say is teach them how to improvise and figure out mm. what's coming on, you know, coming out inside and how to get that out because that's something that will stay with them their whole life. You're singing my song. I know I don't mean the pun, but it's so true. I love that you said that. And uh, to me, I actually am a classical violinist, started playing when I was five and quit when I was 14. And when uh -huh. I came back 10 years later, I came back to traditional folk music, which is all about improvising. And it's interesting to me because it can be a struggle for some people to find out how to play within the music like when you're playing jazz and and making sure that you get back to the one right there's such there's something so important about being able to go apart and come together and so when you're doing this when you're when you're working on that part of yourself because i have to ask this pete because this is the innovative mindset podcast when you're working on that part of yourself when you're working on the part of yourself that that is innovating within the song within the music within what you're playing how are you doing it? What part of yourself are you accessing to be able to improvise? It's really funny. I, I mean, my, my instant thought on that is I have no idea. Mm. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's the, the place, I mean, to improvise well, you need to practice a lot. You need to have, um, Riffs that you can land on and go back to. So you, you you do an exploration, but you know that within three, four, or five measures, you're going to go back to a place that you're familiar with. And then you have different hand motions that you practice in terms of scales and ways that your hands move. And so you can you can do that riffing and and then get back to that to, to a place that where you you know where you are. And the more you do it, the more it just takes on a life of its own i don't know if you find that when you improvise you just you just start going and you know it, it'll sound familiar if you look at one improvisation session to another but not necessarily that familiar you'll have some patterns and things like that that are go-to's but you're in a place where you're kind of in this spiritual liminal space if you will where it's just happening and at least it, when it when it sounds the best that's the place that i'm in and, and I think, you know, songwriting is like that, too, mm. right? When you come up with the, with the hook or a lyric, it just sort of shows up. And it shows up because you're in, in, a, in a peaceful place where that creative energy can just come in. I'm nodding. <laughs> I'm just realizing you can't see me. Uh, you're going to notice that, you know, radio DJs call this dead air, but you're going to notice that I sometimes pause when we're talking because I'm taking it all in and I'm sort of allowing myself to really listen and synthesize. So I don't call it dead air. I call it anticipatory air. And I, I, I have to tell you, Pete, it's really interesting hearing you talk about that notion of jazz improvisation and the fact that it it is this state of being peaceful and open that allows you to be present enough to do it. I think is crucial. I, I agree with you completely. And yet one of the things that I think 
that you touched on was improvisation doesn't happen or flow easily until you really know your stuff, right? First, you need to know the rules in some ways before you break them. And so when you're doing that, you also come into songwriting and you're and you're writing, you know, that's to me, songwriting is so special because you're creating something that has never existed before. And we can say there's nothing new under the sun, but at the same time, you're putting words together and melodies together and notes together in a way that no one else ever has. And this is a strange question. How do you know when the song you've written is good? <laughs> no, I don't think it's a strange question at all. I think in order to write a song for me, if you hear that noise, that's my me drinking from my water bottle. Mm. Um, in order to write a song, you have to fall in love with it while you're writing it. Mm. And a friend of mine once said this to me, and I, and I agree with it, is that if you don't think the song that you're writing is the best thing you've ever written while you're in the process of writing it, you're not going to finish it. You're just going <laughs> to you're going to stop. So so for me, um, you know, I've gotten reasonably objective and I can tell after I've, I've written, but in the process of writing it, I think it's the best thing ever. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that I've I've done, I've kept this songwriter circle thing going. I have a group of people that, you know, will go through five weeks or seven weeks where you have to come up with a new song every week. Mm. And you bring it to the group and everybody has to bring one. And, you know, we have five or six people and everybody plays their song twice and you get critique from others. And a lot, you can get some great feedback there and you can kind of tell if your song is uh, emotionally resonating with them. But also it's when, when you play it and you play it over and over again, you know, did, how do you feel it? But so, so for me, it's, it's, it's a combination of how I feel about it, but also the reaction I get from others. And then I have a fabulous producer. You know, I actually spent uh, all day yesterday with Rob Mathis, who made my last two records. And I have a whole batch of songs that I've written. I have 10 new songs after this record, after Spaces. And Rob is amazing. And we go through and I play him the songs. And he's, um, he's, he's a great friend and a great ally and also uh, – a very tough critic. So I know that if I play a song and Rob's like, oh shit, man, that's good. Hey, that's, you know, uh, uh, okay, I got something. Um, so, uh, you know, yesterday it was, it was, it was a great day yesterday because I, I got the hell yeah, that's good on a, on, on a bunch of songs. I also got the, yeah, I don't know about that on a few. So um, <laughs> now the good news is that my opinion of them and his were pretty correlated, not perfectly correlated, but pretty correlated. Yeah, and and it's great to have a sounding board like that, I think. You know, when you're in that situation and you're going, I can no longer tell if this is good. I, I need someone else's ears, and it's good to have someone whose ears you trust. And yet, when we're in that situation, you know, you said you have to love the song while you're writing. You have to be completely in love with it. it it's interesting to me. My first record, I... The, the song that was sort of the, quote, big hit, even though no commercial success, but we'll call it a big hit. Uh, the, I'm sure it was. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes, for sure. Uh, but the inspiration from the song for the song came to me from a passage in my favorite book, just happened to be rereading it. And I was in the shower and the sun was streaming in through the bathroom window and and everything came to me all at once. And I went, oh, that's the chorus of a song. Great. And it has to do with Sherry Tepper's Gibbons Decline and Fall. Great. So I was inspired and basically didn't finish rinsing my hair of shampoo because I had to run and note down what I had just sung to myself. And so I'm wondering when you're in that process, when you're in that creative process, how do you A, get inspired and B, how do you capture your inspirations? Oh, so what you're talking about is when a song just comes to you. Yes. And there, there are a number of songs on spaces that have, you know, just come to me. It's like when you wake up and you go, boom. And, and I can tell you a couple of the stories. Um, Please. You, you get on the piano and you, for me, you know, I have a piece of paper and a pencil nearby. And a lot of times I'll also, if I have a computer nearby, I'll just like, I'll put the lyrics down there because it's so much easier to edit and cross out and do that as opposed to a piece of paper. But oh, my, I almost always start with paper. Mm. And once it, I've got the full song form, I write there and then I relentlessly, you know, uh, edit usually the verse lyrics, you know, just go over and over them and I say, okay, wait, is this good enough? And then I sit with it for a while and I keep going. But when that inspiration comes, it's so important that you follow it. Mm -hmm. right? Because that idea, I mean, at a, at a minimum, 
if you have the idea and you can, I mean, I've had, I've been out surfing and um, in fact, the song you mentioned earlier, Gone, uh, you know, it just came to me while I was surfing and I'm like, okay, remember this, remember this. And I ran back in, rinsed off and, you know, got on a piano and um, it just started playing it and it was there. Um, so, uh, if, if, if you happen to have, if I have my iPhone with me and I have a melody that comes to me, I'm just going to, you know, sing it into the iPhone and okay, that's great. Or a lyric idea, I'm going to put it there. Um, so I have a, a folder, a file of lyric ideas that come up and I come up with them like, oh, I want to write about that. Oh, I want to write about that. Um, you know, I mentioned the songs on spaces so that there's, and anyway, I'll, I'll tell you more stories later, but I'll let you keep asking me questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, please. I mean, if you have stories, I want to hear them. And, and in part, it's because one of the things that fascinates me is how a creative's mind works, right? Because we we are often told, especially when we're young, not to be creative. We're we're often our, our creative impulses are sort of, uh, I would say, depressed by others who say things like, oh, you need to go have, quote unquote, a real job, right? Don't try to follow your creative muse. Don't try to do that. Instead, you need to be someone who takes care of business first, who who knows how to put food <laughs> on the table and all of that. And so you kind of have done that. You've you went through this place, it seems like where you've gotten you've got the, the successful business, you've got a family that you love that is doing well. And you've gone, you know what, music is the thing now. And this is what I'm going to do. So I'm wondering, what was that like for you when you were growing up and you went through and you studied classical piano and then you got into jazz and you got into improv and all of that you also still did the the business and the poker playing and creating crosswords and all of this other stuff because you you're like me you when something fascinates you you're like i'm gonna find out what this is and see how much i really like it and now music is the thing actually wait 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 no but music music has always been the thing uh -huh. um, I, a couple things first of all um, I haven't grown up yet. I mean, you, when you were growing up, I, and, and I don't ever plan on growing up. I was, awesome. Uh, so, um, but I've never, I mean, when you say business, I mean, you know, knock on wood, I've been lucky to be pretty successful in what I've done. And that's given me the opportunity to give a lot back. Um, I never did it for anything other than passion. I was always, I was always, I was fascinated by music. I loved music growing up. I mean, it was, it was a happy place for me, and math was also a happy place. I was a mm. real math nerd. Um, yes. But I had no interest in finance or business or markets, and it was kind of a random thing where I had I had played piano for uh, – I was playing piano for a gymnastics team, and I, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And I went, I went to a good school, but I, I, I didn't think, oh, I need to get a job. I kind of realized, oh, yeah, I probably need to make some money. I had worked for a software company doing some programming for a summer. And I was not excited about the full-time offer they gave me in New York. And I, I said, oh, I think I'll do it. But I, I kept putting it off, and I got to California. I ended up uh, being a rehearsal pianist for a rhythmic gymnastics team. <laughs> I, had, I had played uh, for a friend in college who tried out for the U.S. team. And if she had come first, I would have been the Olympic pianist, but she came fourth. But I ended up meeting a coach in California who had uh, a bunch of girls that needed music. So I was doing that and, and realizing that I loved California. I wanted to stay in California, but I needed to make some money. And I knew how to program. So I, I looked around and I ended up working for a, a, a firm of, uh, that was started by a Berkeley professor who was a Zen Buddhist, a guy named Bar Rosenberg. And they were a financial consulting firm. And I had no interest in Wall Street or trading or markets um, or no knowledge about it. And then all of a sudden I realized that, oh, what they were doing was all math and it was kind of cool and it was a really interesting puzzle. And that's what ended up leading me to being fascinated by poker and then eventually deciding that I wanted to use my math talents to figure out a way to beat markets. And that's what got me to start a group uh, on Wall Street <laughs> of all places and uh, knock on wood, that, that group is still thriving. And, um, but it was always a passion. It was never about, oh, I need to make some money, um, which was, you know, but, but it got really exciting and interesting. And the puzzle was really hard. So it, it drew me in. And I, and I think 
you know, earlier I, I alluded to um, getting to uh, getting back to songwriting and having a breakup because I got obsessed about something. And it was when I built that group, I got really, really obsessed. I went to New York and I had this opportunity to build a group that used math to beat the markets. And it was way harder than I thought. And I spent every waking minute thinking about it. Mm. And um, turns out it's hard to sustain a relationship when you pay no attention to it at all. Uh, surprise, surprise. <laughs> I'm shocked. Um, so, so what happened? And it actually worked because I was I was really alive and happy while I was building it. But once we got really successful, I realized that the thrill for me was figuring it out and winning, but not continuing. Mm. And uh, and on, and that I had sacrificed music along the way. I had, mm. I was living in New York. I had a grand piano in my apartment, and you know maybe I'd play it every couple nights. I mean, I really it, it just it was the one period in my life where music was was not an important part. And I eventually suffered emotionally because it wasn't coming out. And and then I basically, I, I, I left the group. I cut a deal where I wasn't going to come back. And right at the end of that deal, I thought they needed me a little bit. And I went back and I ended up back in charge. And, but when I did it, I said, I'm going to have balance to my life. I'm going to live in California. I'm going to continue playing music and, and, if they want me to keep running it, I will. And I don't know, here we are <laughs> 15, 20 years later, and it all seems to still be working. So, and, and it's because for me, when I engage in something and it's, it's something I'm passionate about and I care about, I put my full self in. And if I do that, it ends up being energizing. So, Somehow I'm, I somehow I juggle it all. It it, so it it gets a little challenging, and you can ask ask, ask my wife. It definitely uh, it, it can be um, uh, it can be challenging being around somebody that's passionate about so many things, but uh, it it seems to work, and I'm, I'm passionate about my family too. That's fantastic. I love it. And it's so interesting to hear you talk about this notion of diving with your whole self into whatever fascinates you, because I, you and I are in many ways kindred spirits. And I, I, yes, I understand that your name is Kindred Soul. So I'm not again, there's nothing intended there. I was just it's true in that I am the same way in that way of what I what I'm doing. I love and I love with every fiber of my being. And that's crucial to its success, whatever it is I'm trying to do. The hard part comes, again, like you said, in interpersonal relationships, when the person you're with is going, what about me? Hello, right? So so managing that, managing your time, managing your goals, sounds like it takes some doing and some cooperation between you and the rest of your family. Would you mind sharing a little bit about how you do that part of it? <laughs> you know, I, I think my, my, my wife would say, well, <laughs> I want to be on this podcast and tell you what it's like <laughs> from my perspective. Um, so um, I, we'll book I, her next. I think, <laughs> I think the most important thing that I aspire to is to be as present as I can be when I'm there. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, but 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 I'd, I'd be lying if it's not a challenge. But so if we if we're going on a vacation, I really want to be present with everyone there. I take each of my kids on a week-long trip every year, and I try to focus on them completely during that week. And, you know, family will take vacations, and you know, I, I think um, I think what really helps is if everybody has things that they're passionate about and excited about, and then they can they can bring that shared energy to the table. I think that that's that that's the most important way to deal with it. Um, but you know, when I'm in the middle of making an album, or deep into songwriting and creating the songs for the album or recording, I'm I'm tough to be around because I'm very obsessive. And mm -hmm. and it's you know I, I write a, I have a monthly newsletter that I write at uh, PeteMuller.com and, and there's a there's a section in the beginning called Deep Thoughts. And every month I write something that is something I'm passionate about or a life lesson or what I've gone through. And I remember one from a number of years ago, you just, you, you triggered it in your question. And, and it was when I'm in the middle of writing a song or creating something, that is the most important thing in the world. 
Mm. And if it's not, I'm not going to do it well. Mm. Right? It, it, it just, it has to, I have to not be focused. I not, not worry about anything else, not distracted, nothing. This is what I'm doing. Don't interrupt me. Don't go anywhere. Um, that can be really hard to be around unless, you know, it's clear that that's what you need for the creative process. And, and, and you know, it was discussing that and, 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 and admitting how hard it is. And I think part of it is, is being really forthright with your partner about, okay, as a creative, if I'm in a creative place, that's where I have to go. And so many of the people, I was just talking to, to Rob Mathis actually about this yesterday. So many of the people that have done brilliant things creatively, Janis Joplin, John Coltrane, Charlie Parker, were kind of in emotionally crazy places when they mm. did it. Mm -hmm. And they you know, <laughs> could definitely be very hard to sustain any kind of relationship. And y you might think, is it actually possible to be that deep and that, you know, that close to, to, to not perfection, but if you will, deep, deep, deep universal spirit and also live in the real practical world. But there are examples of people that have done it. The, the one, um, the, the person that I think about there is, is Matisse, actually the painter mm. who, uh, who, you know, had some amazing paintings, but as I understand it, he was also, um, married and a doctor and had a, a family that worked. <laughs> mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. uh, to me, that that's an inspiration that you can create amazing, great art, but also be a functioning member of society in a way that works. And, and I aspire to, to both. There's a song that I'm writing. It's not on the record, and, and but it'll be on, uh, on the next one. It's one of my, my favorites. I've actually just played Rob yesterday. It's called And. And the chorus is hold on to what you want and hold on to what you got. Um, and, and, and that to me is, is, is kind of the spirit, which is that, you know, having a family and a deep love relationship and a connection there, in addition to being able to create and inspire that, that, that combination is, is challenging, but it's really worth going for. And you have to go for it in all the dimensions. I'm so glad that you said that. Absolutely. And I love the chorus. I think that there, there's a world in that chorus. There, there are definite many, many possible moves. And, and it's interesting to me, uh, Salvador Dali is the person I think of who just loved Gala, his wife, so much, had a beautiful relationship and also created fantastic, incredible, inspiring art. And I, yeah, I think it's absolutely possible to be both, to, to, to be both alive on the practical and also alive on the inspired and creative. So congratulations for working on it and for doing it. And I, I actually, you, you bringing up being in the studio, I would love to talk a little bit about the new album and, and what inspired the songs? How did all of this come together? And also we haven't talked about the band at all. I'd love to know a little bit more about Kindred Souls and how that band came together and how you're making the project work. Uh, so which one do you want to start with? Well, let's start with, you were in the studio, you're recording the new album. Let's start with the present and the future, and then we'll move a little bit back into the past. Um, cool. So which songs would you, are you curious about on the, on, the, on the album, or do you want to just talk about the process? Well, I, first of all, I mean, Gone, Gone seems kind of self-explanatory, but... I, <laughs> maybe it's not. Uh, I Gone, I, I really liked. I liked uh, Tin Palace also. And so Spaces is one of those albums, I think, that has, uh, it has a lot of passion to it and, and a fair amount of heartbreak, it seems like. And so I kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit about how how you got inspired to write those songs and the process of putting the album together. It's changed so much in just the last few years. You mean the process of recording? Is what you're the saying. process of recording, the process of putting an album out. I'm assuming you're involved in that process as well, because it, it's different. A, a creative can no longer just be the creative. They often have to wear many hats. Um, indeed, indeed. Um, the, we made that the, the record spaces kind of in a reasonably traditional way in that we recorded all the instruments we didn't use synthesized instruments. Uh, we recorded a lot of it at Power Station in New York City, um, the recording studio that I've been intimately involved with that I you know, uh, actually helped save, but that's a different story. 
Um, and then we uh, we actually put down horns and strings at uh, uh, Capitol Records in L.A. Ah, and, you know that was you know that that was Rob saying you know this record's too good. You need real horns. You need real strings. Let's do it. Um, and I love we it. Did and I'm and I'm thrilled. I was thrilled with that process. The um, the laying it down. I I I I went with my longtime rhythm section. Uh, Skip Ward and Dave Silliman, Skips on bass and Dave on, on drums, and uh, we put down the groove in uh, uh, with the record, and and, and I, you know I would we would we would play it kind of as the trio, and then we would take their parts, strip them out, and then I would redo separately a piano track on top of that, and then I would sing a lot of vocal tracks, and Rob would comp the vocals and put them together. You know, with 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 the idea that you know you don't you don't want to do any auto tuning. I mean, you want something real and authentic, but you want to choose from a lot of different uh, interpretations. And, and so I I would sing the song a, a number of times on different days, and then he would listen through and you know take the take the verses that sounded the best for each song. And um, you know, then the, that that's a painful, tedious um, process. Um, uh, and uh, our, our amazing engineer Alex helped out a lot on that, um, and and then I would listen with Rob and go like, don't like, let's do, and we would we would tweak um, the the Kindred Souls put on a uh, a bunch of backing vocals and some violin um, uh, and some guitar, uh, some saxophone on the record and on different songs, and uh, yeah, it was a uh, the process. We actually have we recorded. 15 songs the record the the release now has 12 of them and then we have three bonus tracks that we're going to put out in about six months uh with a double lp um so uh it's quite the extensive project uh we decided that we we wanted to have every song we recorded see the light of day uh so that that will happen but then you know we picked 12 for the for the, the main release um and and then it came down to shooting some videos which we did uh and the, the the first song we did, we decided to release. There there are a, a bunch of emotional songs on the album, as you've pointed out. Uh, we decided to uh, to start the record and to make the first release, uh, if you will, the, the one, one of the lighter, more fun songs. And it's, it's Tin Palace, and and there's a whole story behind Tin Palace that I can uh, that I can tell you if you want if you want to hear that, or we can talk about one of the other songs. Um, no, no, no. I whatever you want to talk about. I love this. Um, so, so the story behind Tin Palace, I, the band uh, was lucky enough to be, uh, playing the Montreux Jazz Festival and we showed up and, uh, uh, my friend Adam Fell was there with, uh, with Quincy Jones. He runs, uh, Quincy's, uh, empire. And, uh, we showed up, uh, right about midnight when the midnight after hours jam at Montreux was starting. And, Adam said, do you guys have your instruments? And we said, no. He said, go get them. And we said, okay. Oh, my stars. We ran back and we, uh, we went on stage and played a, a number of songs for people um, at the beginning of the jam. And then it kind of went into this blues jam. And I was on piano and Hools was on a saxophone. Skip uh, was, was on bass. And this uh, very spiritual barefoot woman came on stage and started blowing on a harmonica and it was really fun her name was was wendy and uh she was clearly connected to the whole crew at montreux i didn't know how and and we connected and resonated we became friends and stayed in touch and she didn't know much about me she thought you know oh, this guy's a musician and she kind of adopts musicians so she asked me at one point to have dinner in new york and just hang out and we did and uh i remember afterwards she she said oh you know i'll i, I you know let me let me let me take care of this um and i we, we we wrestled over the check but she she bought me dinner and she didn't know much about my other life and and and, and about pete but but we stayed in touch and we we, we stayed friends and um, at one point I was going through some, some tricky emotional stuff. We would, you know, kind of, kind of friendship where you trade emails every couple months and you say hello and stay in touch. And, um, 
she said, well, you don't seem like yourself. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a little funky and about to fly out and, and go record an album. And she said, you know, I have this spot called the Tin Palace. And I, I have a bunch of friends that I invite there occasionally to, uh, if they're going through tough times. And I'm like, well, I don't, and, and, and it's really funny because I hardly knew her. I mean, we played music together at Montreal. We had this one dinner in New York. Um, you know, we talked about, life and everything but that but that was it and you know i mean just, just in case it doesn't it, it, it completely platonic just kind of you know friendly on the spiritual plane thing and but i'm like okay well what is this about this is kind of weird i mean do i trust this and i thought yeah my gut says what the heck and i went and uh i can't say much about the tin palace except that there is a video that shows part of it but it was a really interesting crazy fun weekend for me going going deep and spiritual and 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 learning some things about myself and um i decided to write a song about it. and that's what tin palace is and my uh our, our uh, video uh video guy chris morgan um flew down um and uh, and he actually ended up spending a weekend there as well going through some of his stuff and he filmed that video and uh, he filmed me in, in, in New York City thinking about that, uh, that journey to the Tin Palace. And now the one thing I will say is um, we've left it as an open question because uh, Wendy does not want the location of the Tin Palace revealed. So I've, uh, she's, she's allowed the video to be out there, but we, we, we ask, uh, we, we, I've, 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 I've asked people to see if you can guess where the tin palace is from the video and so far nobody's come close um but uh the whole idea of it is thinking about a place if you will and it's it's not actually necessarily a physical place it's an emotional place where you're free and the constraints of life and society don't matter where you're just yourself and you let it mm. all go and that's what the song is about that's what the, the 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 chorus that kicks in and lifts you is about so anyway i think that was a very rambly story about um about that song it's it's a it's kind of story i'd want to listen back to but uh <laughs> well was, you'll you'll have the chance when the episode airs <laughs> in, indeed that's right we are live it's uh that that's the thing you get with me is that whatever's you know on my mind i will just talk about it i love um, that that's, that's the great. hardest thing you know it, it, it it's funny musically that actually that 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 really works in in running a company i've been told that you know pete it's it's clear that you're really open and vulnerable and you know always direct and say what's on your mind but sometimes maybe you don't want to share you know if you're the ceo and <laughs> don't I'm like, share you know, everything that, 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 <laughs> that's that's just my style i'm going to tell you what i'm thinking good or bad but i'm always you know and it and it's funny and i try to do this in music and everything i always try to come at it from love and generosity but also deep truth Mm -hmm. and and you know that that's you know if you're if you're trying to trade stay true to your spirit and um yeah that's 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 the only way i approach things it, it gets me in trouble sometimes but mostly yeah mostly it's a very good thing yeah i think i agree with you completely it, it can get you in trouble but that's often because the person you're speaking to isn't ready to hear the truth, maybe regardless of how you say it, you know, I, I to me, I think there's a sense of recognition when you hear something that you need to hear a part of you recognizes, oh, that's something I needed to hear, even if it feels uncomfortable, sometimes uncomfortable is okay. If it's for a greater good, if it's for a greater cause, or if it's if it's towards your highest path, I think there's often we hear things and we're like, oh, I probably didn't. Oh, I didn't want to hear, but I kind of needed to hear it. So there's a difference between what you want and what you need there. I respect the way you do things. I promise you, I respect it a whole lot. I also respect that you have a life to get back to. And I have all sorts of things I wanted to ask you, which I would like to ask you when you come back sometime, <laughs> because mm -hmm. we didn't even talk about music and its relationship to math. I want, there's a whole to me, you know, thinking about Bach and, and his mathematically perfect music, I thought 
Pete and I are going to have to talk about. We won't have time. So, so yeah. come back and, well, and I'm, chat I'm about open, that. Well, I'm open. You know, we can, we can squeeze a little more time out if you want to. <laughs> if you want to hit a couple other things, I'm. I I would love to actually. I mean, part of this is you have synthesized what some people would consider disparate disparate interests and careers into one life that works very well for you for the most part i mean everybody has their challenges and that to me is there's a math nerd in there who likes things mathematically perfect i get that and there's also a musician who loves the notion of of improvisation that still comes back to being in the pocket so i want to tell i want to ask you about that about your your philosophy of being able to do that of of forming these groups like kindred souls like the company that you formed that that is doing wall street through math all of those things what is the philosophy behind that that lets you do that and then if we have time i'll ask you about math and music okay cool no i i thank you for asking me that because i think you know i have a i have a fairly unique philosophy in it and and it actually you know, has worked for me in terms of my company and with the band too. And that is that, first of all, you have to come from a place of trust and love, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If you, if you want to work with somebody and do something great, you know, and there's a connection, you need to trust them. They need to trust you. And, and sure. I find that the easiest way, the most important way, the best way is to start by trusting. And then if you trust, what's going to happen is, Sometimes you're going to be let down, right? If you're too, if you're like, wait, can I really trust this person? You know, and you're too afraid and you don't make that first move and you don't expose yourself and you're not vulnerable. Well, unless they're willing to do make that first move, it's just never going to happen. So you start with trust and you realize that if you trust a bunch of people, you're going to get it back most of the time. And if you don't, then you've learned not to trust that person and it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. So you, you, to me, the intent always has to be that whatever you want somebody to do, you have to feel like it's good for them and that it's helping them be the best person they can be. It, it's got to be out of love. It is not out of your needs, right? So, so it, it has to be motivated that way. And, and the second bit for me is that I get really turned on by watching people grow and learn. Mm. And mm -hmm. if you – this is from a friend of mine that I actually work with in my company. He, he, he said to me, you know, Pete, my philosophy is that – having grown is great but growing is painful as hell mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's that's true is the process of becoming the best person you can be um is is a is a painful process because you have to realize that there's a way that you're being that is not working for you you and you have to change it and i've realized that for myself there have been a bunch of things that i've changed and i think in the future that i will continue to change so when i try to lead or, or coach other people, I, 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 do, I push them mm -hmm. and I, I challenge them to do with love. And, and I carefully monitor how they're doing because for them to really change and grow, they have to get to close to a breaking point where they're like, wait a second, okay, here's my limit. And then you push back. But the, the mistake I think many people make is they don't push hard enough because they don't want anybody to get anywhere close to that breaking point. The tricky thing is you don't grow unless you go through that pain. Mm. So what mm. I've managed to do with my group, and I, I, it, 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 you know, <laughs> uh, it, it, and because we have a lot of people that have been there for a very long time, I have uh, hundreds of employees, uh, believe it or not, uh, is is to push in a way, but only once they have that trust and they know that the reason I'm pushing them is not for my own interest, but for their own growth. Now. It, it's also in the interest of the company and for us doing well, but it is never at the expense of their happiness. Mm. So there's some people that are just not that ambitious, and for them, you don't want to push them, right? Because they they don't want to grow, and they're perfectly happy where they are, and that's great. And you know, it, it, most of the people in the world, you know, get to a certain point, and that's that's enough, and that's great. And you have to be careful it's a mistake i've made in the past sometimes it's to think that everybody wants to keep growing that that's mm. not necessarily true but the people that i love continue to work with are the ones that really want to grow so it, it, extending that to the band uh you know we the the souls we the the core of the souls uh 
is Missy Saltero, who is a singer that I met more than 10 years ago and a dear mm-hmm. friend. We met at a mutual friend's wedding, and somebody said, you guys both play music. You should play a song together. So we did, and it just was magic. And awesome. It was, it was Bob Dylan's To Make You Feel My Love, mm-hmm. you know, the one that Adele covered. I, and it's funny, um, you know, we, we'll still play that occasionally. And, and we started playing together. And then John Hooley, who I met in Santa Barbara a number of years ago when I needed a sax player. And John's a talented multi-instrumentalist. Um, and, you know, he really wanted to do more and more with me. So he Im- improved his guitar chops tremendously. He's learned how to uh, play bass pedals while we play as a group. So he'll play bass pedals and a guitar. And, of course, he's, he's also a good singer, and he does our harmony arranging as well. So we have the three of us. And, and uh, John also encouraged Missy to learn how to play the cajon um, that had uh, – that, that gave us the ability to travel just as a quartet mm. um, and um, and not need the full bass and, and drum configuration. So we, we have four voices when we play live. Mm. We all harmonize. And um, it, it, it's been so fun to watch both of them grow on this journey and, and me grow as well. You know, I, when, when we first started playing together, my ability to sing harmony was – was kind of non-existent. I was a lead singer <laughs> and that was it. And, and now, you know, the, the, the blend of our voices is really fantastic. And, you know, I mentioned the three of us, the fourth member, Martha McDonald on the violin um, uh, also sings and, and plays the violin. Um, she's a pro. She actually left the band for a while um, to go on to Broadway. And she's, you know, once you're a kindred soul, you're always a kindred soul. Um, <laughs> and then we had Aubrey Richmond, who's a violinist and singer and mandolin player from LA. Who's, who's going to be on this tour with us. And, and she's also always a kindred soul. Um, so, we, so we've created this thing where we have four voices that all, uh, harmonize well together. Everybody plays, uh, an instrument and some people play multiple instruments like John. Um, so it, it, it's quite a, a varied show and, you know, as as the person that puts it together, I, for me, I try to make sure that everyone is loving what they're doing, feels great, is growing in a way that they're excited about, and that chemistry and energy works really well. But it's also, you know, a band is a family too, and you have conflicts in a band that you have to sort through, and you know, you have to, you know, talk things out, and people also have real families outside of the band, and that gets that makes things tricky too. Um, but, but I found that the, that if you, if you lead with trust and love and you, you, you push people, but only as much as they want to be pushed, that philosophy tends to, tends to really work. Um, I love that. I, I keep, I just keep saying, I love that to everything <laughs> you're saying. I realize that, uh, but it's so true. I, you, know, you could be an honorary kindred soul. <laughs> I would love that. See, you know, and there I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> I sing, play guitar and violin and also recorder. So if you ever need a recorder player, you let me know. Uh, but you know, it's interesting. What you said is so fascinating to me because uh, thinking about, this is me being an environmental educator for NASA for many years, because I think about a germinating seed before a seed breaks through a shell, it has to go through a pretty violent process, right? So in order to reach for that sun, in order to reach for becoming the plant it was meant to be, a seed has to go through trauma and a seed has to go through pain in order to get to the good stuff later. Okay. So it's a it's a very natural process, even if it's one we sometimes want to avoid if we can. And it's interesting to me what you said about uh, helping people become the best versions of themselves. I do this workshop called Work in Harmony where I go into companies and organizations and I teach the people at these companies and organizations how to sing. And many of them are terrified, but by the end of the time that we were work together, they are singing in three-part harmony and it's an hour and a half and they go from nothing to three-part harmony, right? So, so it's possible and it does take that frankness and kindness in order to be able to do it. So your points are very, very well taken, as can be witnessed by 
many, many different people who were terrified to sing before I got to them. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's a really cool thing to do. It's a, it's, it's one of the joys of my life, I promise. So I, I like, like I said earlier, Pete, I could keep you here for the next six hours chatting, and I know you have a life to get back to. So I have, before we do the little bonus episode, I'm wondering if you can give a website or something where people can find you and find out more about you and, and about the music. Oh, for sure. If you go to PeteMuller.com, P-E-T-M-U-L-L-E-R.com, uh, you'll find the, the new album. You'll find the, the video for Gone that uh, it, it is all the loves and, and it's one great. for Pentalis and a whole bunch more. There's one for the, the other side. That's a really fun one. And uh, a bunch of stuff on our tour dates and the Kindred Souls, a little background on all of them. Um, so there's a ton. And again, that's PeteMuller.com, M-U-L-L-E-R. Uh, you can also find us on Instagram and Facebook, Pete Muller Music, and uh, yeah, yeah, and, and the course, YouTube on channel, Spotify same thing. And YouTube, and <laughs> YouTube, all, all, and all those places, all the every everywhere where music is. That's right. Well, and, and yeah, the reason I ask is that people learn differently. And so all of that stuff's gonna be in the show notes and you saying it will also help it stick in people's minds. Pete, I have, before we do the little bonus thing, I have just one more question that I ask everybody who comes on the show. And it's a strange little question, but I find that it can yield some profound answers. And the question is this, if you had an airplane, environmentally friendly, of course, that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? <laughs> if I had done my homework, I would have been prepared with an answer, but I think <laughs> I'll give you a better one real time. Um, oh, wow. I love it. Um, I, 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 you know, there, there are a bunch that are flashing in my head. Um, um, Okay, so I'll give you my top choices. Okay. You know, so for the touchy-feely, you know, make the world a better place, I would, I would be lead with kindness mm. or kindness first, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, if, uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to pick some song lyrics. Um, and I, I think this that works probably for me. most appropriate for now, which is remember to laugh when it gets strange. I love both of those. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, that's from a song, Ready to Go. Um, uh, uh, or Blessed Are the Cracks Inside Us, For They Lit in the Light. Mm. But I would, uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I could probably keep going. Yeah, but, you know, while, and, and but, that's uh, great. You know, we would run out of, we would run out of uh, sky writing ink. <laughs> Yeah, that's why I ask about skywriting, because it's got to be succinct. It's got to be concise. Pete, I am super grateful that you took the time to be here on the show. And you're going to stick around and do the bonus round real quick. But I wanted to just make sure that I say thank you. What an enjoyable conversation. And again, please accept my gratitude for taking the time to be on the show. It's all this was such a pleasure. I really, really enjoyed it. And I, I, I feel like we could keep talking for uh for for a long time it feels like our, our minds work similarly and our our view of the world is it, it, it is pretty much in sync so thank you for having me <laughs> my pleasure i yeah this has been such such fun getting to nerd out with another musician is always a joy for me uh this is isolde trachtenberg for the innovative mindset podcast reminding you to head to the show notes reminding you to check out pete muller and his music as well as all the other cool stuff he's doing and the next time you do the new york times crossword puzzle it might just be by him so shake shake your fist at him like i probably will do next time i try to do the new york times crossword puzzle until next time i remind you as always to be bold be creative and most of all be kind <laughs>Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2022. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, remember to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Thank you.